Our journey begins in 1967. Yes, one year before my favorite Hobbit adaptation, there was... nobody's favorite. The story behind this adaptation has been documented elsewhere, but the short version is Rembrandt Films bought the film rights to The Hobbit, but had to deliver a full color film by a certain date. And when the budget for their ambitious project wasn't approved, they just sat on the rights, not expecting to do anything until the sudden uptick in popularity of the books pressured them to make the bare minimum of what the contract would consider a film before they could sell the rights back to Tolkien. So yeah, this is pretty much the Roger Corman fantastic four of Tolkien movies, just cheaply rush out to technically fulfill a contract. But what's the film like itself? Well, it's not very much like The Hobbit, I'll tell you that much. This is the Arkenstone of old. Boy, really taking the heart of the mountain literally there. Suddenly, it was all destroyed by the monster lizard Slag the Terrible. Yep, they renamed Smaug to Slag because this was before the invention of Urban Dictionary. Only three survived the flames. A watchman who slept when the dragon came creeping. You had one job! And you look real bored about your failure to fulfill it. Torin Oakenshield, general of the now destroyed Garrison of Dale. But he's still keeping his rank even if he has nobody to follow him anymore. And Princess Mika Milovana. Ooh, I loved her in the fifth element. Gandalf whispered General Oakenshield. Only the great wizard Gandalf can help us now. Oh, you're just saying that because you're desperate to see another character who was actually in the book. So it has come to pass, said the great wizard, that Dale has been destroyed by Slag, and that he nests on the treasure in the carved halls under Lonely Mountain, just as it is written in the great book. Okay, fine, I'll read the Silmarillion already. Then it is clear that the time has come. The time of the Hobbit. It's the time of the Hobbit for loving. I'm done. So rather than most versions of the story where Gandalf just seems to take a special interest in Bilbo and pushes him to be a burglar, here there is an actual prophecy, not just that the dragon will someday be defeated and the Mountain King will return, but that Bilbo specifically will kill the dragon. You shall lead this group over the impassable barricade mountains, through the impenetrable Mirkwood forest, across the poisonous desolation of slag, to Lonely Mountain itself, wherein the horrid creature lies. You must creep into the deepest great chamber of the old jewel mines of Dale and kill the fire-spitting dragon slag. A fascinating story, said the small hobbit. And now, if you have all finished your breakfasts, it's been a great pleasure to meet you, and I wish you lots of luck and all speed. Okay, that was a legitimately good comic turn there. This short has its moments. That dragon has killed my father and all of my people. He has burned to ashes my golden land of Dale. Now he sits on our treasures and waits his time to strike other lands, maybe even here. No, 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 the Shire's safe from outside world and filmed adaptations. Nothing bad will ever happen to the Shire, no need for any sort of scouring. If you are all afraid, then I shall go alone. Bilbo was shocked. He shouted at Gandalf, but this is crazy, she's only a child. Oh, I see, that's why they need Bilbo. It's not the prophecy, the princess just needs a babysitter. The conscripted dragon slayer and the three survivors of Dale struggled across the great barricades. Gandalf the Grey watched from his own distance. He knew well what terror waited along this craggy path. So he'll gladly send the company into danger, but he won't actually be helpful. That depiction of Hobbit Gandalf might be the most faithful part of this adaptation. Anyway, they do the troll scene, except the trolls are called groans for some reason, and Bilbo does the ventriloquism instead of Gandalf, so this is officially the earliest instance of a Hobbit adaptation giving Bilbo more agency than the book gave him. And in the grand scheme of things, this is not a terrible scene to do it in. As they moved forward again across the great barricades, the survivors had a new opinion of their small hobbit dragon slayer. Perhaps he might prove useful after all, thought Torin Oakenshield. Aw, that would mean something if you had shown Thorin doubting Bilbo and not just pleading with him to join the quest. Suddenly, Bilbo was gone. 
Oh, maybe he'll find Balin, Dwalin, Feely, Keely, Oin, Gloin, Ori, Dori, Nori, Beefer, Bofer, and Bomber, wherever he is. Down to the roots of the mountain. Down to where there is none but Gulu. Wait, is this where the 1968 radio version picked up that pronunciation from? Did everybody's least favorite adaptation influence my favorite adaptation? Probably not, it's probably just coincidence because basically nobody saw this film, but huh. A weak and rejected creature found what Gandalf the Grey still seeks, the One Ring of Power. Spoiler alert, we don't actually see the Ring of Power being powerful in this version of the story not even turning Bilbo invisible. Bilbo did have the ring. See, perfectly visible. Magically, the one ring of power had found its true bearer. Is this also part of the prophecy? That only a hobbit can wield the power of the ring? If so, can the Samwise the Strong fantasy come true? Anyway, they have an uneventful trek through Mirkwood, they find the dragon, Bilbo realizes that they need to shoot him with the Arkenstone, which isn't the worst idea for a Chekhov's gun, it's better than whatever Jackson was doing with the Black Arrow, so he bravely steals the Arkenstone with the token note that it might have been the power of the ring that gave him the bravery, but that sounds like a Michael's secret stuff gambit to me, and they bravely band together to kill the dragon in his sleep. And so he did it just as Gandalf knew he would. And the city of Golden Bells was built again, and Bilbo and Mika reigned there together. But this is crazy! She's only a child! Well, and that's the first known filmed adaptation of Tolkien. It's an inauspicious start to the legacy of Middle-earth on film, to be sure. As an adaptation, it's truncated at best, completely unfaithful at worst, and as a contractual obligation, its existence is crass, to say the least. But even though it's a cheap scam, I don't hate the stylistic choices. I like Adolf Born's artwork here, and the use of still images and narration brings to mind, like, those videos you'd watch in grade school that have, like, Aesop's fables or other classic stories. You know the ones I'm talking about where it'd just be a narrator and illustrations, but it would be on VHS. Am I just old? That's what this feels like, and that's how this works best. You know, if you think of this as The Hobbit, the movie, obviously it's terrible. But if you think of it as, like, another retelling of a children's story that has been retold and retold and changed and adapted throughout the generations, it feels exactly like that. And if Tolkien's goal was to create a mythology for Europe, a true sign that the goal has succeeded is seeing the mythology get retold and remixed over the years, with different versions of the tales being told in different ways, many being wildly inaccurate to the original tale. So on that front, I like that this exists as a piece of Tolkien ephemera, even if just to fuel the meta-narrative of Lord of the Rings being Europe's mythology. It's just wild that technically, this is the officially licensed animated hobby. Hobbit movie, and the Rankin Bass one isn't. That one that so many people love and grew up with, that's just a fan film. But this is the one that's legal. A scam, but a legal scam.